uh, we welcome ha Harry now, his brother. Hard one to follow. Okay, um, this is a short piece that was written some months ago before uh, Roland's health got really bad. Um, bear with me, I've never really read it out loud before and it's never easy being a support act for a Roland S. Howard show. Um, it's called A Short Account of the Dark Prince's Existence. Um, Roland S. Howard was born in October of 59. His blood was red, he had lots of digits on his hands and feet, and moved about in a suitable manner. So they let his mother, father and sister take him home, walk me home. He was soon kicked out of the pram to make way for his younger brother, that would be me. Uh, for running about purposes, Roland was clad in the standard issue Howard boy garb, thick cord trousers and a flannel shirt. It was possible to see that his ears did in fact stick out and that his nose was mildly pronounced. It would have been unfair to compare him with an eye eye at this early stage though. The monkeys were big at the Howard house. Roland drew like a fiend. He took up guitar lessons in the early 70s. I guess he was inspired by progressive rock, glam, Barrett, Roxy Music, Eno, and lots of David Bowie. He may have also been subliminally influenced by his parents' musical evenings, at which his father played the recorder and his mother played guitar and sang. Roland read like a fiend. He's read two books a week for many years. As time went by, he found an interest in US underground sounds, like the Velvet Underground and the New York Dolls. The next thing I knew, the Stooges and Iggy Pop exploded onto our lounge room. Will you still place your bet against the neighbourhood threat? Roland had been learning sax and dabbling with bands. There was Tutho and the Ring of Confidence, with school friend Simon McLean, and a bit later, the Obsessions. There was Punk too, of course, Suddenly we had Anarchy in the UK and I'm Stranded, both of which I remember him prefer preferring the B to the A sides. No time for messing around with you. Uh, I couldn't possibly say how it worked after that, but he was a voracious consumer of vinyl and he had all the punk and stuff of note, all the punk stuff of note, and was always very knowledgeable about what was going on. Didn't like the clash much. Roland met the boys next door at a party somewhere. Nick, Caved, Nick Cave accused him of being a poofter, but Roland was more than witty enough to deal with that unimaginative missive, and they probably found themselves amusing one another. They were both very funny. Soon they were in direct competition. Roland's band, The Young Charlatans, with Ian Ollie Olsen sharing vocals, guitar and songwriting, began playing live. They were instantly applauded as a less punky and more arty alternative to the boys next door. People, well, the Melbourne post-punk scene, and they were the people, loved them. And it was here Roland la launched the song Shivers, written at 16. It will probably make him more money than any other single thing he does in his career. Even mother couldn't tell that my baby's so vain, etc., etc. I might say that his mother insisted that she could tell, but what she could tell exactly, I don't know. Roland dressed in tight, mainly black clothes. His hair was short. He wore armbands saying the model of youth and a badge which said October, part of a date set he removed from a bank. His white socks alone were enough to get you a beating in the sunny suburbs of Melbourne. Roland looked so extreme for the time that I don't think people could visually register him, so he got away with it. The Uncharltons imploded upon Ollie's unwillingness to share a band. By this time, Roland's friendship with Nick, Mick Harvey and Tracy Pugh and Phil Calvert had grown, 
The boys next door admired his abilities and saw Roland as a possible way to help with their slowish songwriting. So he took that role, played by quite a number now, that of friend, helper, collaborator and inspiration to Nicholas Cave. He was assured that he could do some singing, so he was happy. The boys next door were transformed pretty much overnight. See side one versus side two, door door. I've been asked to comment on Roland's Fender Jaguar. Roland's first guitar of note was an Ibanez Firebird copy. It was a very stylish guitar used by Phil Manzanera and Brian Jones and Johnny Winter. However, he had always been impressed with an old Jaguar that Ollie Olsen had briefly owned. <coughs> Roland found his Jaguar, which Genevieve actually ended up owning, I think. Um, Roland found this guitar in a shop in the centre of Melbourne. When he asked to see it, he was informed by the shop owner that if he expected him to get it down from the wall for him, then he would have to buy it. I saw it in his house the next day. My request to have a turn wasn't overly welcome, and I felt like a crippled gorilla as I delicately raised it from its case to place on my knee. It's a post-1966 model, but I don't know the actual age, with block inlays and bound neck, but I'm really getting nerdy now, and it has fuck all to do with the way Roland plays guitar. Uh, P.S. It was always matched with a Fender Twin Reverb, with a veritable malaise of reverb dialed in. Roland once described his fingers as sluggish and slow. Praise the slug, I say. Whoever knew they could sound so good. Whatever limitations he may have had, they contributed to the style he wound up developing, and a gorgeously terrifying sound that he clubbed, coaxed, and bled out of that strung up electrical thing. He did what many failed to do, found a unique combination of elements and touch which sounded like himself. I think that eventually Roland and Nick just grew apart. Roland was writing his own songs and singing and playing, etc. So it was natural, natural for him to be able to go off and pursue an, a sol his own career. He already had songs earmarked for the purpose, and although he was basically always loved what the birthday party didn't achieve, from what I understand, he was envisioning leaving the band at some point. Mick Harvey stepped up and temporarily parted ways with Nick, and the band folded. We all know the splendid Blixer Bargeld filled Roland's shoes in Nick's next project, and Roland bided his time with Crime of the City Solution before launching his own band, These Immortal Souls. <laughs> These Immortal Souls had a lot of potential from the start. They immediately had an audience in Germany, Austria, and Denmark. With a little help from Sonic Youth, they became the first non-American band to sign to SST. They could have quite easily gone a level or two higher in popularity, but remained unorganised throughout their career, they certainly did. Roland was, a, was as creative as ever, but he would involve himself in side projects, an LP with Nicky Sudden, for example, and there would go half the tracks for our follow-up LP. Eventually, we did make that follow-up, but we left it too long, and the, so the impact was really depleted and the production a bit weak. Roland was very inspiring musically, though he didn't give, give much encouragement or always recognise the importance that plays in a group effort. It was soon clear that he intended to call all the shots in the band, which was frustrating for the rest of us. Everything seemed to fade away until eventually we broke up. Everyone was probably mildly dissatisfied at this point, and it seemed that we had just missed out on doing quite well for ourselves. Roland came out of it in great form. His solo albums are really powerful and focused achievements. Roland seems to, ha to have a thirst to prove and differentiate himself generally, which along with his passion for music seems to be what keeps him working. I would guess that he knows himself that at his best he is as good as anyone you can name. And the longer he can do that, the greater his achievement is. Roland's quest is to banish banality from the kingdom. Thank you all for your time. Thanks, Harry, and we. Uh